Shalom, I'm Dr. Deanna Dye with Foundations in Torah, working in conjunction with the Hebrew Roots Network. And we have been laying the foundation on the fig tree for quite a few weeks now. Last time, in the previous two sessions, we really delved into the concept of the king of Judah and its relationship to the fig tree. And now we're going to move ahead and start talking about the whole concept of redemption and the fig leaf and what that means and what God was trying to accomplish. So let's go to our first scripture, and that's in Genesis 3, 7. And it says, And they sowed a leaf of a fig, of a fig tree, and they made themselves waist cloths. That would be, in one translation, probably better translated aprons. Now, we've talked about the whole concept of the word for fig, and uh, has something to do with um, reproducing, uh, being very fertile, a male searching out a female. In, in its very root, the aleph and the nun, ain, which is the root then of te'ena or, or the fig. And the idea is of the, of the sexual urges of when a male searches out a female for reproducing. And that's, in, that's the concept of the fig tree in its very root. So that, that root there, on, uh, to produce, it means to be very vigorous. It's like uh, the power in the loins for reproduction. It's interesting that this is all connected to the fig tree. And also it has within it the, con the, uh, the element of sort of something creative. So the other, the other side of it is that the, that the power within the loins can also be for vain purposes, that it can be a work that produces no results. So what you find in Hebrew thinking is that almost every word has sort of a positive and negative to it, if you will, where there's uh, two aspects of something. So in this, the word on to ena from the fig has that concept as well, these uh, sort of a positive and negative. So it, it can be the positive in the idea of the vigor and power for reproducing, but on the flip side, it can also be talking about sort of a vain work that basically produces no, no good results. So when we, we talk about the barren woman, she would be on the other side of this. And then the, the, the wife, the woman that produces fruit uh, and brings forth many children, such as in the case of, of Rachel and Leah. Uh, of course, Rachel was barren for a period of time and then brought forth Joseph and Benjamin. So this is sort of the uh, kind of a two-sided thing, if you will. So with Adam and Hava, Adam and Eve, um, and they have rebelled against God and they have been diminished and they are in the, the garden and they recognize their nakedness and they make an attempt to cover their shame. Interesting that they use a fig leaf to cover their shame. So the the negative side of that would be that they are using something from the fig that will produce a, a work that has no results, that is not beneficial. So in their own strength, they cover themselves, not with a covering that God would provide, but with the covering uh, that they make from this, them, for themselves, the, the fig leaf. And let me just mention, it doesn't say fig leaves in the Hebrew, it's actually one fig leaf but it will be the animals, the skin of an animal that will produce the proper result or the proper covering for them, uh, not the fig leaf as they have designed. So let's look at that word for apron or waist cloth. It's a hagar in Hebrew, and it means to gird or to, uh, halted. It means to become lame. It can also be a belt for attaching weapons. And I've mentioned in previous programs that the leaf actually represents the commandments of God, and we, we talked about that quite a bit. So considering when you follow the commandments and without the life of the Spirit, they don't really provide any beneficial, anything beneficial to you. Uh, uh, dead works really have no value. So in them, covering themselves with the commandments, if you will, but there's no life-giving spirit, uh, it doesn't provide anything for them. Uh, and it would be the life from, from an animal, that, an, the blood of an animal that was shed, and that skin would be the, would be the proper covering. Um, the Torah, following the Torah, has never been for salvation. Um, there's no 
people think that if they obey the commandment in exactly the right way, that somehow they're in good with God and they get some extra brownie points. But this, this is not the case. The, the commandments are there to follow, but they have to work in conjunction with the Spirit or there is no life in them. So it was that they initially they violated the commandment of God, and we can see here in the, in the Torah scroll. But it, in a sense, they, they violated the commandment and then they cover themselves with a fig leaf and, in the place where fruit is supposed to be produced. But they don't produce anything but dead works. So in order for there to be life produced, then something of an atonement has to take place. And so the regeneration by the Spirit is going to take place. And as we see the animals being sacrificed or being offered and the blood is shed, that is a sort of our teaching mechanism to show us the importance of the shed blood, that the life is in the blood, it's not in the fig leaf, okay? The, and the, the leaf is where we have the commandments and the fig represents new life coming forth. However, they've done it in their own strength. They've covered themselves in their own strength to produce new fruit. Now this is a prayer from the Siddur, and uh, so if we could just look at that, um, it talks about enlighten our eyes in your Torah, attach our hearts to your commandments, and unify our hearts to love and fear your name so that we may not feel inner shame, nor be humiliated, nor stumble for all eternity. So the key is instead of attaching the, the leaf, if you will, to, uh, to cover their nakedness, that, that the, the Torah commandments need to be attached to the heart because that's the key to all of this. It's the, it's the attitude of the heart. It's what we call in Hebrew the kavanah and how we approach. And that's where the, mo that's where the life is. Not, the literal life may come out of the loins, but the life of the spirit comes out of the heart. And so that's the, that's the place that we want to cover or we want to attach our commandments, the Torah commandments. And this particular prayer that said that in the Siddur is a prayer that said in, in recognizing the sovereignty of God. Again, all of this goes back to God, his kingship, his sovereignty, etc. Now, if we, uh, we look at our next picture here, and this is one probably you're familiar with, but the idea, again, is not to attach the commandments to the place that uh, the, the fruit is born, but to attach the commandments to the heart. And they try to produce new life in their own strength. There was no regeneration of the heart when they attached the fig leaf. And so, again, without atonement, there's not going to be any regeneration. There will be no new life that will come forth. And so in, they attach the, the, the fig leaf to the place that brings shame, where, new, where seed is produced. But uh, in, in essence, the heart has not been regenerated because there's been no change. And um, that's not where obedience comes from. The obedience comes from the heart. I thought this was kind of an interesting scripture. It's uh, obviously a metaphor for, for kind of what we're talking about. It seems rather odd when you read it in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 13, 11. And it says, for just as a loincloth clings to a man's body, I made the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Yehuda cling to me, says Adonai, so they could be my people. Again, this loincloth takes us back to the Hagar, to the to aprons, to the waist cloths. And so um, seeing how the, again, to the fig leaf, how that attaches to the body. So Jeremiah was commanded to take this loincloth and hide it in the cleft of a rock. Very strange imagery to me. And so it was hidden and it was buried. And then he was, uh, the loincloth was dug up and it, it was discovered to be ruined and useless. It wasn't useless for anything. So in, in essence, the, the loincloth that he's talking about was only effective when it was attached in relationship to God in obedience to the commandments attached to the heart. And uh, that's where the power of it is. That's where the power of the spirit is in, in terms of the regeneration of the heart. 
And God said, God will ruin Yehuda, this people who refuse to hear my words because they live according to their own inclinations and they go after other gods and they do not love the Lord. So again, this is all about a heart issue. And at that point, Adam and Hava, their heart in a sense wasn't in it, that they did not attach the commandments to their heart, but they tried in their own strength to, uh, to walk in the commandments. Uh, here's just another scripture. This is from Psalm 119.13 that says, I cling to your testimonies. O Lord, do not put me to shame. And then from Romans 12.9, it says, hate what is evil and cling to what is good. So attach again to what is good. So now uh, I'm going to take, uh, take a little bit of a turn, although we're still dealing with the attitude of the heart because this is really the key to everything. And there's a special word here. We're going to associate it with the leaf when we, uh, in a couple of these verses. But the, the word here is naval. And so if we look at it, now you might recognize it as Nabal, and that's in the story of um, Abigail and Nabal, but really in Hebrew it's naval. And that name, Naval, means foolish, to fade away, to wear out, or the idea of the flowing away of life. And so we find it in uh, Psalm 1-3. Um, it talks about for those who, don't, who, uh, who do not walk in the counsel of the Lord, who do not bring forth in its season, whose leaf withers. And so that leaf there withers is the word naval. So the life going out of it, the, the word naval being fool or referring to foolish, that which fades away. And really this is the story of naval as, and we'll go through it in just a moment. Let's look at uh, Jeremiah 8.13. And he says, I will surely consume them, says the Lord. No grapes on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree and the leaf shall fade. That's our same word, naval. The life will flow out. It will be foolish. And what I have given them shall pass away for them. So just kind of keep that in the back of your head. Naval means foolish or to wither away. And as we find it a, a lot in scripture in relationship to a leaf. Uh, let's look at Isaiah 64, 6. And it says, you're probably familiar with this one, all our righteous deeds, like menstrual rags, we wither, naval, the life flows out of us. We are all, all of us like leaves. So this comparison again with leaves com connected to the Torah commandments, to trying to observe them without life, without attaching the commandments to the heart, but rather attaching the commandments to the place that brings shame as what Adam and Hava have done. And so one who does that is as a leaf that withers. One who does that is one who is foolish. Um, the, the foolish one ends up being associated with what we consider to be the wicked. Um, this isn't a term that's used to mean uh, somebody who's frivolous, okay? This isn't about frivolous behavior and the fool. This is about one who has already been judged wicked. This one is unrighteous and the blood, uh, excuse me, the life is flowing away from them. We're, we're not speaking about frivolity here. So we have a scripture from Psalm 14, which pretty much sums it up. It says that a fool, Naval, says in his heart, there is no God. So this is really the key to all of this. The, the fool Naval is the wicked one sealed in their wickedness who says in their heart that there is no God. So there was a reason that it tells us in the gospels to call no man a fool. It's not, it's talking about you, you don't know the condition of a man's heart you call him a fool, you're basically declaring he's been sealed in his wickedness. He's been sealed to destruction. And so, and you don't know. And so only God knows that. And so it's very dangerous. It would have been dangerous at that time to use the word and to, uh, to determine that somebody had that condition. Now today we use the word fool for an idiot or whatever, but uh, anciently in the, and certainly in the first uh, century there, they would not have used that term uh, I suspect they would have recognized that that term meant 
to seal someone in their own unrighteousness. Now we contrast this with the righteous, and if we go to Ezekiel 47, 12, and this says, on both riverbanks will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. There will be a different kind of fruit each month because the water flows from the sanctuary. And this takes us back to Psalm 1, talking about the righteous, that their leaves will not wither or die, their fruit will not fail. Their delight is in the Lord, and they delight in his Torah on which they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams. They bear fruit in their season, and their leaves never wither. So that's the contrast between the leaves that don't wither and the fool, Naval, who says in his heart, there is no God. And we continue with that, uh, that verse in Ezekiel. It says, so that this fruit will be edible and the leaves will have healing properties. So we have an association here between the leaves and the healing properties and then the fruit being edible takes us back to the fig fruit, the fruit that's sweet, that's uh, pointing to the mature believer, the sweet fruit that stays on the tree and ripens and comes forth in its season versus the green fruit that is unedible, that simply just falls off the tree and dies. And so it is that the, the commandments of God will bring healing and they will be part of the tree of life. Certainly Revelation 22, 2 connects these two together, that the tree of life will produce 12 kinds of fruit and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. That is the Torah will bring the healing of the nations. But it has to be attached to the heart. It can't be uh, attached anywhere else in order to bring the life forth from those leaves. Now, we actually have a, a scripture in the book of Acts that refers to the same thing. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, Acts 19.11 says that God did extraordinary miracles through Shaul, that's Paul, for instance, handkerchiefs and aprons. It's our same word that, that Adam and Hava made, aprons. And aprons that had touched him were brought to sick people. They would recover from their ailments and the evil spirits would leave them. So uh, it's kind of interesting to me that, that that same word is used now in the context of the healing, that the, the, if, the if the commandments are attached in the right place to the heart, then it brings healing. And so it is that the, the righteous, with their leaves attached to the right place, uh, they never wither and they never die. That is the leaves. So with that sort of background laid, we're going to talk a little bit about the story of Naval and Abigail. And you can read this in 1 Samuel 25. It's a very interesting story. So Naval, or Nabal, is described as being uh, foolish. That's the meaning of his name, foolish or wicked. Remember, one that has already been condemned or already judged, one that is in a, an eternal state of separation. And what is it that Nabal did? If you think in the story, Nabal rejected the kingship of David. He rejected David as the true king of Israel. He did not recognize his leadership. He chose not to recognize his leadership. Now, Nabal was a very wealthy man. He was a leader. Um, he was a very influential man, and he was also from Judah, which is interesting. So David as well from Judah. In fact, Naval was from the house of Caleb, or Kalev. Um, and just sort of as an aside, Kalev, we could argue, means uh, can mean all my heart. And so uh, the one Kalev, Caleb, was the one who loved God with his whole heart. And he was in the line of Messiah. Now we have this guy, Naval, who is a fool, who says in his heart that there is no God. So that is the kind of the backdrop for Naval. Now, um, and we can see in our next picture here, his business and where he got his money was, uh, was in sheep. He had, uh, as I said, he was a wealthy man. He had 3,000 sheep. And uh, he was from a place... Uh, called Carmel, 
which means a garden, and it was speaking of a, of a uh, field that produced abundant amount of fruit. So he was wealthy, he had sustenance, he was prosperous, and, uh, and he, had, he had a lot of sheep. Now let, let's just look at this verse here in, uh, in James, Yaakov 1, 9 through 11, because what does the scriptures have to say about a rich man who has not been regenerated? It says, the rich man will fade away in his walk. And that term fade away is the same word, naval, the life flowing away from him. And so this is, this is the state of a rich man who has, says in his heart, that there is no God, that he, basically the rich man, has made all things possible himself. This is the same uh, picture when you apply the commandments in the wrong place uh, and you think that you're walking them in them in your own strength. Um, this is not what it's about. Everything, everything in the end really has to deal with the heart. Uh, if we look at Isaiah 40, Verse 8, it says that all flesh is grass. The grass withers and the flower fades. And that word fades, again, is naval. But the word of the Lord stands forever. So that remains the key in all of this. Now, if we go, uh, we look at our next uh, picture here of David walking, because he was coming out in from the wilderness he was the one, David, when he got there with all his men, he was the one who had provided protection for Naval's servant when they were in the wilderness. But Naval, Naval didn't do anything to honor David for doing that. He pretty well rejected him. And so it tells us in that passage that uh, it, uh, he came to Naval and it was at a, a festival time. So there was a festival going on. Uh, Yom Tov, possibly it was Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah or Yom Truah. Well, we're not really sure, but it, it appears to be from some of the other elements that, w and we get to them. So at the same time, Naval is holding a feast, and let's just look at that picture as well. And he's holding a different feast in his house. It says like the feast of a king and that his heart was merry within him from drinking wine. So it's kind of like another spirit was operating in him. He was holding a feast, his heart was merry with wine, and it as though another spirit was operating, not the Holy Spirit. As though he was blaspheming against the spirit by not recognizing the authority of David. As David is God's man who would be raised up as king over all of Israel, and he refused to honor David as king. He refused to provide him with food and sustenance and refused to feed his entourage. Again, this man is the epitome of the fool who said in his heart, there is no God, that he has rejected the word of God and the leadership, and he is walking, if you will, in a counterfeit spirit because his heart has not been regenerated. Now, Abigail comes along and tells Naval that basically she stepped in to prevent David from utterly destroying him. She recognized that her own husband was a fool. And so he, by her intervening, she protected Naval from being destroyed and all the males in his house. And then the scripture tells us, and we can see in our next picture here, that his heart died within him and he became stone. And then it says, 10 days later, then he died. So he died and then he died. So his heart became stone and then he died. And that was 10 days later. So we have an imagery here of going from Rosh Hashanah, if that was the time of the feast, to Yom Kippur and the 10 days in between. And what are those 10 days in between? They're the time in which the everyone is judged, whether they're righteous or wicked. Now, he's already been judged wicked because he is a naval, a fool, and he has been judged for eternity, and apparently he knew it. His heart died first on Rosh Hashanah, and then he became a stone, and so he was judged wicked on, uh, by the time Yom Kippur came, the gates were closed, and, and it was sealed, and there was no more opportunity for him to repent. So he, in, a, in essence, didn't even have an opportunity to repent because he'd already been sealed in his wickedness. Now, not everybody, this is a story that just, that uh, tries to bring this home. I'm not saying that we know when, what condition people are in. Only God knows that. But God knew this guy 
was, uh, had rejected him. He had rejected David as king, and then he, his heart was hard, and his, and his heart died within him uh, at the time of Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur, and he was judged wicked. So the gates were closed, the gates were sealed, and now he is experiencing eternal separation from God. And this is the reality of the Naval, the one who is foolish, who's been judged foolish. So in the course of that, we can see in our next photo of the marriage now, Abigail is released. It's kind of like us, if we're attached to the enemy. We've been released, and now we can marry and be betrothed to the true king of Israel, David, and he takes her as his wife. So it's a kind of a prophetic picture of of the uh, of the redemption of the believer at Yom Kippur when the believer is finally delivered and released and set free from our oppressor and so she became David's wife and so the fool has been judged wicked but the the bride Abigail has been released to join David the king so it's kind of a, a compelling picture then of this uh, relationship between the bride and the groom so we will uh, pick it up next time, and we're going to talk about in the tree with uh, Zacchaeus and the sycamore tree. See you then. Shalom.